Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. We'll turn with me with one scripture, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to read a couple other scriptures before I get to 1 John chapter 4. But I want to have all of us there. If you have your Bible, you have your phone, whatever you're viewing the scripture, 1 John chapter 4. Amen. Look forward to tonight. I feel like God is going to minister tonight in ways of, and bless us in ways that I believe are so needed. And so looking forward to that tonight as well. Again, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your hospitality. What an honor it is to be here. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 reads, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. And someone say amen. 1 John chapter 4 in your reading. 1 John chapter 4 verse 4 reads like this. Ye are of God little children and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. How many believe that still? Amen. I want to set the table before you're seated. I want to just say that this is a a journey that God has me on as I have ministered to my own church and different areas. There is a mindset of dominion that's been over my spirit. A dominion, authority, taking ownership, rulership over situations. My subject this morning is dominion over Satan. Dominion over Satan. I want you to fasten your seatbelt. I'm going to take you on a journey through the Word of God. And I pray today that there is victory in your life and in situations you are facing. Would you put your Bibles down? Let's give Jesus one more praise, hand praise. Would you, would you lift your voice with that hand praise? Come on, will you let the devil know? Come on, would you entreat the heavens? of Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. I was shocked when I read this statement. I really was thinking that it was just a catch. There was no substance. There was no reality to the statement. The statement comes from a research firm that many of us would follow. At least you would recognize the name. It came from Barna Research. The statement is simply this. Americans are now more confident about the existence of Satan than they are of God. George Barna, in his worldview inventory for the last couple of years, evaluated the perceptions of God that people have in the U.S. Among the survey's most surprising findings are that more Americans believe in Satan than believe in God. And that more people, get this, believe that Jesus was divine and a sinner. More than they believe that he was divine and sinless. When asked about the existence of Satan, 56% said Satan is not merely a symbol of evil, but is a real spiritual being and influences human lives. 49% on the other hand said 
they are not entirely sure that God even exists. The author concluded, Americans are now more confident about the existence of Satan than they are of God. That's never been said in America before. We are living at a time when there is a true attraction, a lure, if you will, to something that is demonic, otherworldly, something that we know is real, but somehow we like to push it aside. 2 Corinthians reminds us how this actually happens. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There is a strategy, and it's really called blindness. He wants to blind the world and blind you and I from the reality of what's going on. He loves to shield us, if you will, put a veil over our vision. That we would not detect, that we would not see, that we would never recognize what is at stake. What is really going on, what really is unfolding before our very eyes. He would love to blind you. He doesn't want you to get truth. He doesn't want you to understand. He hopes you would never come to the knowledge of who Jesus is. He tried to keep some of us from acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord. Satan, you have come too late. Because there are already a lot of us that believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. If he could keep you from that revelation that you needed to repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus and be filled with the Holy Ghost, if he could keep you from that revelation, then his job is done. If he could have kept the man of the Gadareans who was possessed with legions of devils, if he could have kept him from bowing down to Jesus, he would have. But he couldn't stop that man who had a desire to be free from the tentacles and from the ploys and from the hardship that he experienced in hell. The mantra of God for the devil is simply this. He would if he could, but he can't. He would if he could, but he can't. If he could keep you down, if he could keep you out, if he could keep you blind, he really would. But he can't keep you from the presence of God. He can't keep you from falling at the feet of Jesus. If he could, he would. But he can't. If the devil could kill you, you'd already be dead. But you're in the house of God this morning. So why don't we put our hands together and just magnify the ability to worship and praise and give God glory. <laughs> Satan has become popular culture. Maybe you've seen it, read it, heard about it. But someone wrote an article saying the sneaker industry is in bed with Satan. When you can now buy some Chucky Taylor Converse shoes that are satanic versions. You can also buy shoes now that have and are produced with human blood in them. They would tell you up front, they're not trying to hide it. These are satanic shoes. There are currently clubs on campuses of junior high and high school that these are not just normal clubs. They will state up front, this is a satanic club that is trying to assemble on our campus. Just recently, there was a group of Satanists that aimed to build a monument in Oklahoma City Capitol, right next to the Ten Commandments. They are not trying to hide, and they're not trying to be sneaky. They're emboldened with our culture, with our current realities, that it doesn't matter what you believe. No one is going to push back. But you have to wonder, 
where did Satan get this dominion? Where did he get this idea? Where did this dominion come from? How did he ever become the God of this world? The prince and power of the air. Where did this begin? Where did the trade go? Where did he get the pink slip? Where did his name get on the dotted line? When did this take place? It's not left to you and I. It's very clear that he knew this. Matthew 4, Matthew writing, and it simply says this in Matthew 4, 8, and 9. Again, the devil taketh him up, Jesus, into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Where did he get the idea the kingdoms of this world belonged to him? That he had dominion, had power, had say over these kingdoms of the world. Where did he get the idea that he could bribe Jesus? Find an easier path. Let him go down a more simple way, a less sacrificial way. Where did he get that idea? It happened in the Garden of Eden. When God gave Adam dominion over the world. You knew he had dominion because Adam was given the right and the responsibility to begin to name things and call things as he wants. If you want to know why a cow is a cow, you're going to have to ask Adam. If you want to know why an eagle is not a giraffe and a giraffe is not a hippo, then you're going to have to take that up with Adam because he had dominion. Minion, he was able to name and articulate things. And when sin entered into the garden, the dominion baton was passed. Satan got emboldened and he got cocky. Now you see him as a serpent in the garden. And now he becomes, according to 1 Peter 5, 8, he's a roaring lion seeking and walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Let me remind you, sweet people, something. Satan has an intention for you and your marriage and your kids. He doesn't want to play games with you. He wants to devour you. He wants to take you out. He wants to harm you. He wants to destroy you. That has not changed. The game has not shifted. So one minister said to break yourself loose from dominion, rulership, the manipulation of the enemy, you have to embrace light. You have to embrace knowledge. You have to get the word of God. This is not just an ornament. It's not just a family heirloom. This is our lamp and our light and our sword and our victory. Can I tell you, heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word, but my word. I wonder if I'm preaching in a church that still stands on the sacred, unchanging Word of God. Oh, God. God. Don't be ignorant in the Word of God. Don't let the Word of God become sloppy in your life. That's exactly how Jesus defeated the enemy. Is when Satan came to him to tempt him, he would say, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. He knew the word of God. Jesus didn't pause and and thumb thumb through scripture. Hold on, Satan. I know there's something in there about that. He had a working, ready command of the Bible. He knew what to say. He knew what to tell the enemy. I have a question. Do you know what to tell the enemy? Can you say it is written? Can you declare greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world? Oh, I feel like giving a praise and and a shout. Come on, let the word of God come out of your mouth. 
Come on. Let the word of God come out of your mouth. Let the word of God come out of your mouth. Your ability, you may be seated, to overcome Satan, the enemy of your soul, is directly in proportion to your knowledge of the Word of God. If you're ignorant of the Bible, then you really don't have the relationship with Jesus that you think you have. To fight off the enemy without the knowledge of the Word of God is like going into a battle without any weapons. You will not defeat the enemy off of good intentions or just a good name or good experiences you have to have the word of God at a ready command to begin to marshal your faith and your future into victory so let me be clear about this the devil is not an atheist the enemy is not an atheist In fact, there is something that the devil and I agree on. The devil and I agree on there is one God. That's what we agree on. James tells us in James 2.19, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. When you begin to declare the name of Jesus, when you begin to say there's one Lord and one faith and one baptism, one God, hell begins to get nervous at the word of God. I'm not trying to get too elementary or too simplistic here, but we forget some powerful doctrines and revelations that when you understand the mighty God in Christ, when you understand that Jesus is God robed in flesh, there is a power, there is an authority, there is a dominion. Logically, logically, if you're an intellectual, you have to ask yourself, how does he know this? I'll tell you how he knows this. Because Satan has been to heaven. He knows what it looks like, and he knows what the throne is. He understands that. It's not a mystery to him. But there are two lies the enemy wants you and I to believe. He wants us to believe, number one, that the Word of God is not true. He'll challenge you. He'll begin to mess with you. It's like one guy comes to his pastor and says, you know what, I I don't know if the Word of God is all accurate. I I hear there's some inconsistencies in the Word of God. I've heard there could be some things that kind of, you know, go against one another. The pastor looked at this man and said, you know, I want to tell you something. I don't believe that. I believe it is inerrant. I believe it is the word of God. But let's just say what your argument is true. Okay? Let's just say for a moment. I believe that this book has less errors than you have. So I'm going with the lesser. Right? That whatever this is, whatever few things you may think are a little bit at odds, I guarantee it is you got a whole lot more errors than you. So I'm going to stick with this one. Can I just be clear? I believe this is the inerrant word of God that is forever settled. That you can build your family and build your faith. I'm I'm not looking for a smoking gun where this somehow gets disproved. I believe it is the eternal word of God. There are are college students and high school students and junior high students that are wrestling with their faith and their doctrines and their understanding of the Bible and God. I can tell you, the enemy wants you to believe this isn't true. Number two lie is he wants you to believe that you can't be happy living a holy Christian life. Somehow you're missing out. 
Somehow life is passing you by. Somehow you, you are getting the raw end of the deal. He, he wants you to believe that somehow you, you've messed it and, and there's others that have a better, easier way and still love God. Let me remind you of something uh, that is so true. That God can show you the men and women and families that have stuck with him and have followed his way and that are still joyful and are still glad they're in the house of God. As one preacher said, the devil can only show you his rookies. He can't show you his veterans. Because his veterans are all messed up and swallowed up and dysfunctional and broken, hurting. His veterans are all crippled, dead, destroyed. But God can show you the men and women that have stuck it out. That have fought the good fight of faith. That have made up their mind. That have settled the issue. I will live for God. Let me tell you. Greater than God's saving power is God's keeping power. Greater than God's ability to drag an addict, grab grab somebody off the street and redeem their soul and save them and put them on a church pew is God's ability to keep you moving forward right in the house of God. You don't have to sow your wild oats. You don't have to backslide. You don't have to serve the enemy to have a testimony. Your greatest testimony is that my God was able to keep me. Come on, somebody. I thank God for the ability to keep me in charge. somebody why don't you thank God for saving you redeeming you keeping you I don't know what it is in my spirit but I feel like you've come in from the battlefield you may be seated Weeks of letting the world influence your soul and your thinking, your attitude, your spirit. You have come already sanitized and drenched in the culture of this world. And yet we have about 30 minutes to preach the word of God, to counteract what the enemy has tried to do all week. I've not come here to play a game with hell. I have come to tell you, you can have dominion over the enemy. The enemy does not have a right to destroy your marriage, to walk over your kids. Somebody's got to get a fight. We can have dominion. We can have authority. So let me help some of you. You may be seated. Let me help some of you. Second Corinthians, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Second Corinthians 2.11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Everybody say an advantage. For we are not ignorant of his devices. We're not dumb. We're not stupid. We're not blind to his devices. And I want you to understand there are some devices the enemy is going to ploy against you. That he's going to try to get you where he wants you to be. Let me just give you a few of them. He would love for you to get offended. He he, he wants you to get hurt by church, by another saint. Somebody didn't ask you. Somebody didn't invite you. Somebody didn't fellowship with you. Can I just preach? Huh? So he wants you to get offended. I don't like what they did. I think think they're doing some things I don't agree with. He wants you to get offended. He wants you to get hurt. Well, well, maybe I don't fit in. 
Maybe I don't belong there. Maybe that's not my place. I'm going to tell you what you're facing. He wants you to get offended. Somebody didn't invite my kid to their kid's party. I'm just pastoring now. I know this church has got it all figured out. You guys are nice to each other, love one another. You guys are actually Christians. But the church that I pastor, I got some real idiots in there. Uh, they, they get offended by little things. Y'all at least get a big old dump trucks worth of offense as you begin you're getting offended. My mind, like somebody doesn't even look at them the right way. Why, why don't I get to hang out with that person? Why, why don't I get asked going there? We get offended. The enemy understands what he's doing. Because we're not ignorant of his devices. Because he'll sap your joy and he'll take your unity. He'll rob you of your peace. He'll begin to take you out. I'm not going to sign up. I'm not going to be involved. Want to know what I know about offense? That offense will never let you go. You have to let it go. You have to let it go. I am preaching to somebody that somebody's hurt you. And somebody's disappointed you. And somebody's done something wrong to you. And you're waiting for that person to get it right before your spirit gets right. You're going to have to let it go. Number two is the enemy. Because we're not ignorant of his devices. He loves when we get discouraged. He loves when we get a little bit low on our faith. And We get a little bit put out and we don't feel the desire, the passion, the the yearning to do the will of God, to worship, to to be involved, to to, to play nice. We we get discouraged. It it didn't come through. The job, the the reality, the prayer didn't get answered like I wanted it to get answered. So we get discouraged. We will play the game, but, but we know we're not in where we need to be. But here is probably my most scary and challenging in reality that that we face in this hour and it's the spirit of apathy apathy is bigger problem than atheism in christianity but that that i'm okay and 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 that i'm not i'm not bank robbing i'm not i'm not sleeping around i I go to church I, i pay my tithes but but there's nothing in there there's no fire anymore there, there's no, there's no passion anymore. There's, I, I, I'm just in the routine. I, I, I'm just making do. I, I, I'm just scratching out an existence. I, I, I'm just, I'm going to make heaven, but I'm not going to make waves as I get there. And it's apathy. It reminds me of a couple that moved here to the United States from an Islamic country, where they knew in their walk with God, they knew that every day they got up and. They would greet one another and they would kiss each other goodbye for the day. That that day could be their very last day of being alive. They knew that if we got caught doing what we're doing, if we got caught sharing and witnessing and praying, that our lives could be very well taken from us. They lived at the edge with a raw passion and fire and a desire and a burden for the things of God. Somehow, in some way, they got the opportunity to move to America. And in America, they found themselves beginning to be less passionate, less hungry for the move of God, less desiring for the things of God. It got to the point where they found their faith begin to slip away. It was the wife that comes to the husband and begins to say, Honey, I think we need to move back. We need to move back. She said these words that have stuck with me and rung with me. She said, I feel like there's a lullaby of Satan. He's just singing us to our death. He is just cuddling us to our demise. He is just wooing us to a low state of our faith. When I, when I felt and heard and read, when I began to understand There is a lullaby of Satan that has taken place in congregations and in families and in hearts in our churches. And he's rocking us to sleep. When's the last time that God woke you up? 
When's the last time you used your spiritual gifts? When's the last time that you praised God without any fear or without any thoughts of anybody else? When's the last time you obeyed the voice of God when he asked you to do something that was out of your comfort zone? One man said, we are living in a time where we do not weep, we do not worship, and we do not wonder. We have been lulled to sleep in our best passions and greatest aspirations and our dreams and what God has called us to do are no longer in play in our life. And we're good people and we're not committing crimes and we're behaving, so to speak, but the lullaby of Satan is rocking us to sleep. My prayer and what I've come to do this week and this morning is to get you out of that lullaby of Satan. That God created you to be an army, to be on the victory side. Come on, is anybody here today that says, God, greater is he that is in me. somebody it's the lullaby of Satan because you may be seated just for a few more moments because what he desires is your faith that dominion that mindset God Our churches need to be reminded again that you have a real enemy. So here's the problem, though, and this is what I want to come to tell you. There's a story that you know in Scripture, and you've actually used the words. When I say the words, they will not be new to you, but the truth of them will be new to you. These words that probably already have come out of your mouth in this message. Because the story is when Jesus is talking to his disciples about what is next. They're going to take me, and they're going to judge me, and they're going to take my life. It was Peter that stood up and said, not so, Lord. We are not going to let that happen. Jesus' response to Peter is this. Satan, get thee behind me. Here's what I want you to understand, and this is what is important. This is what you have to leave with this morning. Jesus was not talking to Satan. He was talking to Peter. But what Jesus understood is Satan's activity in his life. Can you detect Satan's activity in your life? Can you detect where he is at work right now in your family? Do you see where he's trying to get your faith and rob you of what God has for you? Do you even know that there is a ploy working right now for your kids? Does anyone see the actions and the activity of hell working against you. When I, when I read that, God just began to just wash that over me. I said, oh God. We, we almost expect someone to show up in a red suit with a pitchfork and horns. We almost expect it to be obvious. But he's subtle. He's sly. It almost begins benign and almost begins innocent. It's a slow drift. It's, it's an easy off ramp. It doesn't seem hard at first and doesn't seem wrong, but it's the path that you begin to take. And all of a sudden, there is no voice and no joy, and there is no faith, and there is no praise, and there is no fire. And you're wondering, am I even saved? Today is not about what the enemy can do. 
Today is about you and I taking dominion over the tactics of hell. It's you and I recognizing that I will stand up and today begins a new battle for me and my faith. That you have no longer allowed to come in and begin to do your will in my life and my family. See, we, we want to fight against the enemy, but we continue to give him access to our life. We open doors that we should have never opened. We've walked on paths we've never should have walked on. And now our hearts and our faith and our spirit and our lives are now in a place of dysfunction, weakness, and broken. How do we get back? Scripture doesn't just leave that to our own discretion. It really gives us a tool, and we find this in James 4, 7. And it simply says this in James 4, 7. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, we like the resistance part. We, we like the ability to push back. We, we like the, the ability to say, Satan, no longer. What we're struggling with is submitting ourselves to God. God, I submit my will to you. I submit my future to you. I submit my faith to you. I submit my life to you, God. I'm not trying to negotiate with God and work out a win-win situation. I'm letting God know that I have no more arguments. I, I have no more say. I, I you relinquish my right. I, I, I am submitted to your plan. Whatever you ask, whatever you say, God, I, I want you to know, God, I'm not kicking against the prince. I, I'm not working against your will. I'm not fighting against you anymore. I, I'm submitting myself to you. You want dominion? You cannot have dominion over Satan until you first submit yourself to God. You're tired of being left out and you're tired of being weakened. You're tired of not experiencing what the Bible says you should experience. See, we, we, we know the Bible talks about joy, but we don't experience joy. We know the Bible talks about peace and life, but we don't experience that. Because we have not submitted ourselves fully to God. I'd like the musicians to come, and I'm going to close this in just a moment. But I know for me personally, there, there came a moment where I had to find myself at an altar and say, God... I'm done running. I, I'm, I'm finished trying to do it on my own terms. I'm, I'm, I'm done with giving what is convenient. See, most of you you, 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 you know what I'm telling you is right, but yet there's, there's something inside of you. I've come to you to tell you it's when you fully surrender. God, I, I'm done arguing with you. I'm done disobeying you. See, delayed obedience is still disobedience. See, say, God, I'll get around to it someday when, when my, my family, when my wife, when my kids, when, when, when I do, God, I, I'm going to come to that point. I'm making my way there. But the enemy is hard at work placing his hooks and his temptations and his warfare and his weaponry against your life and your family. So marriages begin to break. Fathers begin to diminish their leadership. Women are the defense in the church and men are the offense. And we begin to lose our way. And all of a sudden, the enemy doesn't mind you believing. He doesn't mind you going to church as long as he sets the limits. As long as he has the final say. As long as he's the one that determines what you do. He doesn't mind you clapping your hands and singing your song and doing all that you're doing. But there has to come a time. I'm taking dominion over my family. As a pastor, I've been praying lately, God, I take dominion over an 80-mile radius from my church. Hell, I want you to know 
that you can't walk in an 80 mile radius of our church and you not fight and find a fight in your hands. Not because I'm powerful, but because I serve a God. Because I serve a God that reminds me greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I want us to stand all across this house. I want us to stand all across this house. I don't know where the enemy is at work, but I've come feeling like God has given me direction for some of you. Dads, men, this church needs you. Moms, ladies, this church needs you. Teenagers, children, this church needs you. But you need a dominion mindset. We're not here to just scratch out an existence or barely make it. I'm not holding on till I just get on the other side. There's an adventure of this walk with God. There's a dominion. And my prayer is that your mindset will begin to shift and say, God, when's the last time you even used the word dominion? God, give me dominion. Dominion over the works of darkness over the tactics of hell, over the spirit of this age that's trying to blind me and rob me and destroy my life and family. Would you bow your heads right now? Because in a moment, I'm going to open up these altars. But I want you to begin to ask God, I need dominion. I know some things are off. I I know some things are not right. I I feel something going on and I I can't put my finger on it. I'm going to tell you, you need dominion over something. Don't not be afraid of that. We, we sometimes are afraid to pray those prayers thinking hell is going to come against me. We shouldn't overestimate the power of hell, but can I tell you, you have the authority. You have what works. You have the name. You have the blood. You have the spirit. You have the word. Satan doesn't want you to have dominion, but today I'm speaking that over this congregation. I'm praying it over your pastor. God, let this church hear Porter Apostolic take dominion over this city. I'm taking dominion, God, over every square inch of this community. God, in an 80-mile radius, I'm taking dominion, God, for revival, for the supernatural. I'm I'm taking dominion over situations and sin and attacks from hell. I'm taking dominion over things that are warring against us, oh God. If that's you, If you're speaking that out right now in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you to get out of your seat and I'm asking you to make your way as a voice, as an action, as a symbol, God. I'm taking dominion. I'm taking dominion. I'm taking dominion over my marriage. I'm taking dominion over my ministry, oh God. I'm taking dominion over my home. Come on. The enemy doesn't mind us just, just trying to barely make it. He doesn't mind us to be nice and play easy. But today and this Sunday morning, there's a dominion shift. There's a dominion shift. Come on, sir. I'm reaching for every individual right now. There's a dominion shift, God. I'm asking for dominion. I'm taking dominion, oh God. God, I know the enemy hopes I miss it. I know the enemy hopes that I miss it.
Turn it for good. Turn it. 